give our seniors a round of applause. I'm going to make you guys stand up here the whole time. You can't sit down. No, I'm just kidding. Um, each one of you in your, in your bag there, um, there's a book. And I hope you don't think gifts that are books are lame. All right. But the book that I've given you this year is called Thirsting for God. And it was written by Gary Thomas, if you've read like Sacred Marriage. Um, and Gary Thomas wrote this book. And it's a, it's a manual. It's a field guide uh, for living the Christian life. And so I, I have, I don't put it down. I use it all the time. It's like I have my Bible and then I have thirsting for God. Uh, because if there's something going on, there's something that thirsting for God has to say about that specific situation. And if you don't have a copy of the book, I'd encourage you to grab one. Gary Thomas goes back through some of the church history and church fathers and, and is like, hey, how did people deal with some of the stuff we're dealing with today 300 years ago? Uh, because what we deal with isn't new. It just has a different label on it. All right, so once you guys sit right here, because I'm going to talk to you all this morning. Can you all join me for a second up here? So when I wrote our message this morning, I wrote it with these guys in mind. All right, so I'm kind of talking to them this morning, and I hope that it blesses you too. Um, and so each one of you over the last year that I've been here, I've gotten to know each one of you a little bit. Elena, uh, funny story, one day, I'm, I think I was at work, right? I'm sitting at my desk, and I get this... Uh, Oh, well, my phone starts buzzing. I look down. It's Elena wants to FaceTime. And I was like, why is Elena FaceTiming me in the middle of the day? And so here's the problem. When, you're, when your name starts with the letter A, um, I get lots of phone calls on accident. And so this was an accidental FaceTime. But, you know, we had a good conversation. We talked for at least five or six minutes. Um, I think I was trying to do everything I could to make it as awkward as possible that she accidentally FaceTimed me. So that was great. Um, but each one of you guys, I, I am excited about your next journey, all right, and where you're going. Um, and um, I want you to know that Yorktown, no matter whether you're going off to college or you're staying local, is a home for you. And the people here are your family. Um, and even if you go off to college somewhere and you're in another city, um, the people here love you. And the people here want to pray with you and support you. So don't ever feel like you're going to go off somewhere and then be alone. All right, we are always here for you guys. And so I want <clears throat> to move forward with kind of this word of encouragement that God's put on my heart for you guys today. I feel like I should just turn my pulpit and look at you. All right. Um, and so we're going to celebrate your transition. You guys have spent the last few years moving from Ham Hamilton, that, that awesome kindergarten graduation picture that all of us have. You know, that white cap and gown, missing teeth. It's awesome. Um, you know, we've moved from different stages in our lives, and, and it's always been in this, like, school environment. And you're, you're going off to college, but it's a lot different. Um, and when you, you step out of high school and you step into college, you're stepping into an adult world. Um, and, and it's going to be maybe shocking at times, some of the stuff that's different. Um, and, and I want you to know that, that God has something to say to you about this. And so we're going to celebrate that. But what God has laid on my heart for you is, is a message about affliction, okay? Uh, the title of today's message is God's Redemption in Affliction. So many of us, we enter into a trial and we hate it. We want to get out of it. We want it to go. But there's something unique about how God uses affliction. And <clears throat> we don't really talk about this a lot. We don't talk about suffering. We don't talk about trials. We, we kind of want to pretend like that doesn't exist and focus on the American dream, right? And, and what's going to be great about life. I'm going to get this degree. And I'm going to get this career. And I'm going to meet this guy or this gal. We're going to buy a house. We're going to have two kids and a dog. And life's going to be great. And, and that's, that's kind of the ideal. But guys, when you step out into this world, there's a lot of opposition up against you. And so I want to encourage you, even though you're going to face opposition, how God can be a part of that. And so we're going to be in 2 Corinthians. If you have your Bible, you can go there. We're pretty much going to stay there the entire morning. Uh, 2 Corinthians, we're going to be in chapter 1, and we're going to look at verses 1 through 10. All right, and we're just going to see what God has to say to us in his word. So before we dig in, let's pray and invite God to open our hearts and our minds. God, we thank you for your love for us. We thank you that you are here. Lord, as we open your word to study and hear from you, God, open our minds to understand. Open our hearts to hear and receive. 
And God, let these, these words kind of sink in and, and change the way we live. And we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. So Paul starts off here in 2 Corinthians chapter 1. And he says, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, to the church of God that is Corinth, in Corinth, with all the saints who are in the whole of Achaia. So it's a typical greeting. And, and typically when you read an apostolic letter, right, you see who wrote this thing and who are they talking to. So it's important to know that we're talking about the Apostle Paul, and he's talking to the church in Corinth. So he's talking to Christians. And I always find that fascinating because sometimes uh, we think that a scripture doesn't apply to us because maybe we're believers. But in this case, what Paul has to say is going to be for believers. And so there's this specific order of his greeting in verse 2 that I want to draw your attention to. All right. And so verse 2, Paul says, Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I don't think it's a mistake that Paul says grace and then peace. Friends, we can't experience the peace of God without first experiencing God's grace. It's not possible. If you're going to step off into the college world, if you're going to step off into adulthood and expect that a career or an education or something like that is going to bring you peace, man, you talk to some of the most successful people in life, and they tell you they will spend years trying to climb that mountain to where they finally get to where they think life has purpose and meaning, and they finally achieved what they thought they set out to achieve. And when they finally get there, they realize it's empty. Most of the time, people who reach the top of the mountain come back and like, man, that was it? That's all that's there? And so we have to experience God's grace, which is really expressed in the gospel of Jesus Christ. When, when God redeems us, see, the gospel, Pastor Jeff does an amazing job. I love the Can We Talk illustration of, of how God has redeemed us. But, but part of the gospel I want to point out to you is that we have to have this understanding and mindset that we, all of us, are separated from God because we've sinned against God. And because we've sinned against God, we have offended this holy God, and God is a righteous and good judge. And a righteous and good judge is going to hold you accountable for your sin. Now, I'm going to share an illustration with you that I share in the youth group, and because it's youth group, I get a little crazy sometimes, so bear with me, all right? This, this illustration might be a little out there, but my best friend here, Trinity, is here, and so I've, I picked on Trinity about a month ago, and we were sitting in the youth room, and I said, hey, Trinity, do you drive? She said, yeah, of course. I said, great. So what happens if you see the yellow light flashing in a school zone? What are you supposed to do? She said, well, I'm supposed to slow down. I said, okay, cool. So what happens if you fail to recognize that flashing yellow light you speed through at 100 miles an hour, and you hit an entire class of kindergartners. Okay, now that's crazy, but it got their attention. And so Trinity was like, dude, if I ran over an entire class of kindergartners in a school zone at 100 miles an hour, I would throw myself in jail. And I said, yeah, that's right. I said, what would a good judge do to you when you stood before him in the courtroom? A good judge isn't going to go, oh, man, you just didn't see that blinking yellow light? Oh, I'm sorry. You know what? It's no big deal. That's not what a good judge is going to do. A good judge is going to hold you accountable to the law. A good judge is going to say, hey, you might not have noticed, but you were being irresponsible. You sped through the school zone. You did some pretty horrible things, and you're going to spend a long time in jail. And Paul kind of alludes to this in Colossians chapter 2. He says, in Colossians 2, 13 and 14, he says, and you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespass by what? Canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. And I think we understand this, right? We live in a system and a society of laws. We understand that if you break a law, there's a consequence. And in God's economy, in God's system, if you break one of his laws, there's a consequence. And the consequence is separation from God. The consequence is deserving of the punishment that God has set aside for those who are not in a relationship with him. 
But I love that. He sets this aside, these legal demands, by doing what? Nailing it to the cross. So it's like this. Trinity's in the courtroom. She's receiving her sentence for this heinous traffic violation. And it's as if Jesus comes into the courtroom and says, hey, listen, Trinity is guilty. She deserves the sentence that we're about to give her, but I'll take her place and set her free. That is the gospel, that we are deserving of what God's wrath and punishment demands. But Jesus Christ in the courtroom of heaven stood before the Father and nailed all of our sins to the cross and said, that's the payment. I took all of their sin. I took all of their shame. I took all of their punishment on me on the cross. And when we recognize that and we submit ourselves to that truth and we invite Jesus Christ to be Lord of our life, we say, God, you're in control. I mean, just the sheer fact that Jesus would take upon himself my punishment, what I deserve, what I rightly deserve, right? When I walk out of there, I'm going to have a different mindset about how I live. If I truly understand the weight of how much I've been forgiven, man, it's going to cause me to live in a different way. Every day I'm going to wake up and I'm going to go, man, I should be serving a life sentence right now, but I'm free. And because I'm free and the person who's taken my place would want me to love others, would want me to help the poor, would help, want me to help orphans and widows, would want me to serve those who are the least. Right? He's, he's, he's taking my life sentence. I want to live in a way that honors him. And as we step into that, that's when we experience God's peace. When we submit our lives and God forgives us of our sin and we enter into this relationship with him, then... We can walk in the peace that God offers. And it's only then that we can walk in the peace that God offers. And guys, your faith is secure in this relationship. God will never leave you. He will always be with you. And I want that to burn into your mind for a second. That when you experience God's grace, you have access to the peace that God provides. And it's important because ask anybody in here over the age of 30, right? Life didn't go exactly how you planned it, did it? There were some bumps along the way. There were some things that you just, man, couldn't have even planned for. And they happen. And in my life, when there's a train that sideswipes me and throws me off the track and I'm just going crazy, right? There's sometimes the only thing that I can do is know that God loves me, right? And that God is going to be with me. And it, this is the prerequisite here for the rest of this letter. That God has redeemed us and is with us and we can have his peace. So point number one we're going to look at it says, I have affliction gives us an appreciation for God's super abounding comfort and encouragement, which he brings to us with the affliction. So let's look at 2 Corinthians 1, 3 through 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in our afflictions so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort which we receive our, uh, ourselves are comforted by God. For as we share abundantly in Christ's suffering, so through Christ we share abundantly in comfort too. So guys, when you read the Bible and you hear a word repeated over and over and over, I don't think it's because Paul needed a thesaurus. I think it's because Paul is trying to emphasize something. So did you pick up on the word that was being repeated over and over? Comfort, yeah. The next slide. It should be, yeah, look at this. Comfort, 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 comforted, comfort. Paul wants us to hear that God is the God of comfort. He also calls God the father of all mercies. If, if, if grace is given to us, uh, this blessings that we don't deserve, right, then mercy is, is withholding from us the punishment that we do deserve. And God is the source of mercy, and God himself is merciful. So God withholds from us the wrath that we deserve. And then Paul says, man, God comforts us, and he comforts us, and he comforts us. And he's the God of all 
comfort. And it's this comfort that we receive that allows us to endure. So as I was studying this passage, I looked at the word comfort. And the the root of this word has the same idea as what Jesus calls the Holy Spirit in John chapter 16. The Holy Spirit is spoken of as the paraclete, the comforter, the advocate. And the Holy Spirit comes alongside us and walks with us and provides comfort. But see, affliction is painful. And sometimes, even though we are in pain, that's when we'll see and receive the comfort of God. So I've I've got a a little illustration I want to share with you. When I was 12 years old, I stepped on a piece of glass about the size of a half dollar, and it went into my foot. And I'm bleeding everywhere. My sister comes into the kitchen. There's blood everywhere. I'm sitting in a chair, like, holding my foot. I don't want to move. Have you guys ever been in so much pain that you finally get into one spot, and you're like, dude, if I move, it's going to hurt more? I didn't want to move. And this is the middle of summer, and my mom has to leave work and come get me and take me to the doctor. And when I got to the doctor, I'm having to move. I don't want to move. It hurts. All right, when I get to the doctor, the doctor puts my foot up. He looks at it, and guess what the doctor does? He takes a needle and shoves it right into the area that's been cut open. And the reason he shoves the needle in there is so that he can deaden the wound that I've received. If you think stepping on Legos hurts, like get a needle shoved into the bottom of your foot. That is no fun. But even though the doctor had to inflict more pain on me, it was for the purpose of being able to heal and fix the wound that I had. And see, when we're following with God, sometimes in the middle of our affliction... When life has become more painful than we thought it was going to become, that's when God steps in and injects a little bit of something in there so that he can begin to really work on that that part of your soul, that part of your heart that he really wants to operate on. And sometimes as, as a physician, right, he has to, I mean, have you ever thought about somebody who's in surgery? Right, you go into surgery because you're, you have something that needs to be removed and And they put you under anesthesia because the doctor is going to cut you. Like he has to wound you to be able to heal you. And sometimes God allows these afflictions and they wound us. But they wound us because they bring us to a point where we begin to experience God's comfort. Where God begins to work in that area that hurts so much. And that's why I think Paul can say that God in verse 3 is the God of all comfort. See, God doesn't leave us without hope. And he doesn't leave us without help. When you go off into your next season of life and you start feeling alone, man, if you have God's grace and you've experienced God's peace, you are never alone. He will always be with you. Always. And then I love this, right? Because God gives us a purpose in the midst of our affliction. Right? He says that I comfort you with the comfort that I received from God. So many times when we're in the middle of a trial and affliction, I don't know about you, but oftentimes I kind of turn inward. And I, I turn into a woe is me. Like everybody I talk to, man, I am just struggling. All of this stuff that's happening to me. Life is so hard. Poor me, poor me, poor me. And that's, that's common, y'all. That's, that's often what we do. But Paul says, listen, I want you to, to experience the comfort from God in the midst of your affliction and then give comfort to others who are also suffering, who are also being afflicted. Now, how does God comfort us? I mean, when you become a follower of Jesus Christ and you surrender your life to Christ, the Bible says that the Holy Spirit lives within you and you become a temple of God. And God's going to walk with you. He's there with you in the middle of your trial. He speaks into it. He provides comfort and wisdom as you are enduring this trial. And God walks alongside us. That's what that word paraclete means. He's our advocate. He's our comforter. He is there with us. So if that's how God comforts us when we're being afflicted, and then he tells us to give comfort to others, what do you think the comfort that we give to other people should look like? 
right? Like, listen, if I call you up and I'm saying, man, I'm really struggling right now and this thing is going on in my life and I'm, I don't know what I'm going to do. Sometimes in church, here's what we're really good at. Man, Adam, that's really tough. I'll be praying for you, brother. If you need me, give me a call, right? And then we move on. But God calls us to walk alongside one another in a sacrificial way. God calls us to walk along people who are hurting, even if we're hurting. My pain and my suffering and my trial shouldn't hamstring me to the point that I'm not able to receive comfort from God and then give it to other people. Amen. When you guys get off into this adult world and you start to experience trials and struggles, it might be the first time that you've really felt the weight of that kind of trial or that kind of struggle. And God's got two things he wants to say to you. One, turn to him and he'll give you comfort. And two, look around because other people are hurting too. And we can walk with each other. There's something encouraging. And it's weird, but there's something encouraging, man. If, if I know you're struggling and I'm struggling and we can struggle together, then I don't feel alone anymore. And then I can give you encouragement. I think another way to, to think about this is what you go through, you're called to. So some of you guys might be going through some junk right now, and you're like, man, I don't understand why God would allow this to happen. And I don't know about anybody else in this room, but it often works out this way. Something I dealt with when I'm 18, 19, 20 years old. You know, now I meet an 18, 19, 20-year-old, and I'm like, man, I know exactly what you're going through. I went through the exact same thing. And here's how God was faithful, and here's how God provided comfort. And so God gives us purpose in the midst of our trial, in the midst of our affliction. And he's not going to leave us. And he wants us to know that in much suffering, God will provide much comfort. In your suffering, as you turn to him, God will provide comfort. Notice, he doesn't remove the affliction. He doesn't take away the pain. He doesn't take away the trial. But he provides comfort within it. He provides purpose within it. See, Pastor Jeff talks about going to the gym all the time. And, uh, and I love this analogy. And I've seen him, y'all. I've seen him up there sweating, so I know he's not lying. And, um, you know, when you go work out in the gym... If you go to the gym a couple of times a week, maybe three times a week, and you're doing a routine, right, you know what's going to happen? You're going to get a little bit stronger because you're, you're exercising, right? But you're not going to achieve the results that you want by going to the gym three times a week, right? I mean, if you're an athlete, Ham, Ham's an athlete, right? Everything that you do in life, every food you eat, how you sleep, where you go has that in mind. Is this going to benefit my athletic career? Is this going to help me? Now, when you're young, you can cheat and eat a hamburger and it might not hurt you so much, right? But the older you get, man, you gotta really be strict with your diet. And if you wanna experience the full benefits of working out, you're gonna have to make decisions in light of that, right? I gotta get to bed early, I gotta eat, I gotta cut out carbs. That's my biggest weakness right now. I love carbs and it's really hard. If I cut them out, I'll lose weight, but I don't really care because I love carbs. I love pasta. So I'm just going to get muscular and have it hiding under this layer. And I'm good with that. And so, guys, listen, when you go off to college and you start experiencing discomfort, you start experiencing trials, right? And you're like, man, I, this, I need to go to church. And if you just go to church once or twice, you know what? You're going to hear some stuff. And if you're consistent with that, you're going to be a little bit stronger than you would be if you don't go to church. But man, if you really want to experience the God of all comfort and the Father of mercies, man, your entire life, all of your decisions have to be made in light of this is what God wants me to be and how God is using this trial in my life to make me look more like him. And affliction, our second point is, affliction helps us to be more sympathetic. Look at verse 6. It says, if we are afflicted, it is for your comfort and salvation. And if we are comforted, it is for your comfort, which you experienced when we patiently endured the same sufferings 
that we suffer. Our hope for you is unshaken, for we know that as you share in our sufferings, you will also share in our comfort. Paul is able here to somehow, in the midst of his struggle and suffering, acknowledge the fact that other people struggle too. And, and in acknowledging that, he's, he's showing that, man, I see you. I see you, and I know you're hurting. But God can comfort you. And then somehow these people still have joy. And I really believe that looking at suffering God's way and understanding the purpose that we have to comfort others increases our capacity for compassion. Let's read that again. Looking at suffering God's way and understanding the purpose we have to comfort others increases our capacity for compassion. See, later, later in this letter, as the Apostle Paul is writing, he starts to reveal something I think that's pretty interesting. It is that the Corinthian church is looking at Paul's sufferings and they're kind of going, man, I'm not so sure that God is with this guy. I mean, the Apostle Paul is really enduring some pretty difficult stuff. And if somebody is really being afflicted that much and suffering that much, is God really with them? See, if we're not careful and we don't look at suffering as something that maybe God allows and we look at other people who are suffering, we might become judgmental. We might start looking at that person and saying, you know what, I don't know what's going on here, but I don't, I don't think that they've made good decisions. I don't think that they really have lived their life in a way that's honored God. And we can become very judgmental and we can begin to judge them in the middle of their suffering. And that's what the Corinthian church started doing to the Apostle Paul. As a matter of fact, if you keep reading, the Apostle Paul, and that's in the second letter there to the Corinthians or in Corinthians 2, he says, he basically says, look, I know that I'm not a good preacher. And I know that I'm short and ugly. That's what he basically says. I know I'm short and I'm ugly and I'm not a good preacher. But listen, he, and he even says, I'm not like the famous preacher that I'm traveling with. But he says, but I know God's word. And God has commissioned me and sent me to do this. And Paul's kind of having to defend himself against his suffering. But man, if we have God's understanding on suffering, when we see someone who is in a struggle, is in a trial, we're going to have compassion on them. And you know what I do, man? I'm going to encourage you guys right now, as you walk with God and as you transition into this world of adulthood, err on the side of grace. Be grace givers. If somebody is hurting, instead of stepping into the life and trying to judge them, step into their life and walk with them. Right? Be sacrificial even. Maybe you have to say no to a couple of things so that you can help someone else, so that you can ease their pain and suffering. I mean, if you do that, you can leave the rest to God. When I first moved to Corpus Christi, I met someone who was, their, their life was just turned upside down, man. Crazy, 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 crazy. Everything was crazy. Every day was a new drama. And I'm talking like crazy, serious drama. And I don't know why, but God put me in this person's life. And, man, I just did everything I could to walk alongside that person. And eventually that person became a little bit healthier, right? And, and things were getting better. And I started to hear from them less and less and less. And then a few months goes by and I don't hear from them. And I got a text message this week. And then I said, hey, Pastor Adam, I just want to say thank you that this time last year my life was crazy, and you walked through that with me. And you were there for me and my kids. And I just want to let you know that um, I got that promotion I was trying to get. And I just want you to know that because you were so kind to us in the midst of our problem, that that's changed how I live. And now I try to pay it forward. And I'm like, man, that is exactly what God wants us to do. Right? I could have stepped in and been like, wow, you know, You've made some really crazy decisions in life. I'm not so sure that uh, 
that you're head down the right path. But instead, I stepped in to give grace. And this isn't to pat me on the back. This is to say, man, as we give grace to those who are struggling, we can trust God that he is going to be in charge of their life and that he is going to use the suffering and the pain in their life in a way that's going to change them just like he's using the suffering and the pain in my life to change me. And we might be in the middle of something, but man, we need to be compassionate towards other people. We need to be grace givers. The third thing that affliction causes us to do is to trust in God more. Look at verse 8. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God who raises the dead. Have you ever heard the saying, somebody always has it worse? Right? Normally it's when you're a kid and you you have a plate of Brussels sprouts and you don't want to eat them. And your parents are like, there are starving children in Africa and you need to eat these, right? And you're like, well, send it to them because I don't want it. So, but there's always somebody that has it worse. And I don't think the Apostle Paul really wants us to know exactly what his sufferings were. But I think he wanted the Corinthian church to feel the weight of his suffering. I don't, I don't think that the Corinthian church was at a point where they were suffering to, the, to experiencing death or, or in fear of death or in despair. I mean, they were experiencing some persecution. They were in a pretty pagan society. And people didn't understand why they were following God. And they, they were suffering. But Paul's like, man, I was suffering to the point of despair and death. And there's something about, y'all, this idea of seeing other people who have it worse than you. There's, there's some kind of principle here that exists. So how many of you guys have been on a missions trip? Okay, listen. At some point in your adult life, you need to commit to taking a missions trip and going overseas. That needs to be something you do. The first time I went to the Dominican Republic, you know, I, I began to see all the comforts and blessings that I have compared to what these people endure. Y'all, I, I gotta be honest, man. In the Dominican, their toilets are messed up. Like half of the seats are broken or they don't have a seat at all. And I, I went to several places where the water didn't work in the toilet and it was just disgusting. And when I got back to the States after that first trip, I was never so happy to see like a Stripes bathroom. That was the most exciting thing <laughs> You know, and normally I'm like, man, I don't want to stop at the gas station. But man, when we got back to the States, I was like, man, that gas station bathroom is awesome. And we we get to experience others' sufferings. And man, there was something interesting about seeing people who lived in a, a house the size of my room with dirt floors. And there were 10 people sleeping in there. And they cooked over an open propane flame with a bowl this big. And that's like the only dish that they had. And you know what they would do when I'd get there? They would want me to eat their food and hang out with them. And then there was this sense of joy that they had. And listen, my friend that I would travel with, he's from the Dominican. And I said, oh, is it just that they don't know the blessings or things that we have? And he goes, no, they know. They know what it's like. They have YouTube, right? They can watch and see what things are like in America. But there's something about in their poverty Right In their affliction, man, God has provided them with comfort. And sometimes I feel sorry for us. You know, when Jesus speaks of, uh, to the disciples and he tells them that it's impossible for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of heaven. You guys remember this story? And then the disciples are like, well, right, like who can be saved? And he said, well, listen, with God, all things are possible, Right? And, and I hate to say this, right, but you might be low on the socioeconomic ladder here in the United States, but man, in the world, you are wealthy. And the challenge when we have wealth is that wealth and success can distract us from learning the thing that the Apostle Paul learns here, and that is that he had to get to a place where he had to rely not on himself, but on who? God. God. Don't run from the trials of life. 
right? The trials of life are like the deadlifts and the squats and the bench pressing. When you do those things, they increase your capacity to endure. They increase your strength. And they help you to see that you can't rely on you. You have to rely on God. Now, I have to pause here for just a second and point something out. Notice what the Apostle Paul says, that he was burdened beyond his strength. That he despaired of life. If you really want to read what happened to the Apostle Paul, uh, he kind of details some of it in this letter in chapters 11 and 12. So just make a footnote and go read a little bit about what Paul had to deal with in chapter 11 and 12. But things I want you to hear from me today, you guys right now. God never promised that he wouldn't put more on you than you could bear. He never promised that life wouldn't get too much for you to handle. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says that no temptation has seized you except that which is common. And he says, but when you are tempted, right, God is faithful. And in your temptation, because of the faithfulness of God, you can walk away from it. So when you go off to college, right, and, and your friends are all around you and there's a frat party, there's something going on, there's lots of temptation, God, the Holy Spirit within you, gives you the power to be able to say no and walk away. It might cost you some friends. It might cost you a reputation. But God is faithful, and you can always walk out of a temptation because of God's faithfulness. But it doesn't say that you'll never be in a situation like the Apostle Paul was where you despaired of life and you were burdened beyond what you could handle. Friends, God allows us to be burdened beyond what we can handle so that we learn to not trust in ourselves, but to trust in him. There's been several times in my walk, right, where I have gotten to a place where I'm like, God, I, I can't do this. I don't know what to do. I don't know how to fix it. And the only thing that I can do is get up and trust you day by day. And guys, God has always been faithful. I don't have everything I want, right? I'm not driving a Corvette to church. But God has always provided everything I need. And he's always been faithful. Some of my hopes and dreams and things that I wanted to do when I was your age weren't realized. But as I've trusted God and allowed him to take control of my life, I'm doing something for his fame and his glory, which is way better than what I wanted to do. And so we have to trust that God is navigating and guiding us. And we're going to experience God's provision, y'all. Here, listen, when you go through a struggle, when you go through a trial, you're going to develop a history with God. And you're going to remember, man, this was really hard and God provided in this way. And then you're going to come up against something else and you're going to go, you know what? God provided yesterday. He's going to provide today. And you can always trust in God's provision. And our, our fourth point here is that affliction gives us confidence in God's power and a greater hope for the future. Paul's faced death and God provided for him. And now listen to the faith that Paul has in God. In verse 10, he says, He delivered us from such a deadly peril and he will deliver us. On him we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. So look at this. There's these three things that happen here. He, he did deliver, he will deliver, and he will continue to deliver. I mean, when you go into chapter 11 and 12 and you start reading about some of the apostles, things the Apostle Paul endured, he was flogged, he was beaten, he was hit with stones and left for dead, he was bitten by a snake, he was shipwrecked. I mean, his life was crazy. All because he was serving Jesus Christ. And in serving Jesus Christ, he began to experience God's grace and God's comfort. And here's one of the things I want you to hear. Like, as you begin to suffer, you can have confidence in God and what he's going to do. And if your eyes are fixed on Jesus and the hope that we have when he returns or the hope that we have with heaven, right, then I can endure just about anything. I've said this before, man. I'll get on the elliptical at the gym and I set the timer for 30 minutes and I know it's 30 minutes of torture, but it's only 30 minutes. And once 30 minutes is done, I can get off. 
right? But if I got on the elliptical at the gym and I never could get off again, like that would be, I would be in despair. I would despair of life. I would feel like I had received the sentence of death. But there's an end date to it. There's an end date to it. I love this quote from Warren Wearsby, the late Warren Wearsby. He just passed away recently. It says, when God puts his children into the furnace, he keeps his hand on the thermostat and his eye on the thermometer. See, God allows pain and suffering. That's what I really want you to hear, is to learn how to suffer well. And I want you to know that life is going to be hard. It might already be hard right now. But God will provide you comfort, and you can have confidence in him. You can have confidence in him. There's one other point I want to make. I'm going to, I'm going to throw this out at you guys. When we need to go back and be grace givers, right? I'm going to close with this. I'm going to invite the worship team to come up. The Apostle Paul tells us later in this book, in 2 Corinthians, to, to not receive God's grace in vain. And when we receive God's grace in vain, I, I've asked a few people, and maybe I'll phrase it this way, don't use God's grace in vain. And so what does that make you think of when you think of using God's grace in vain? And, and most of the people I surveyed said to use God's grace in vain means that even though God has saved me, I'm going to continue to sin. I'm going to keep doing what I want to do. And, and yeah, that's, that's a way that we can use God's grace in vain. But the Apostle Paul also says that to use God's grace in vain is to withhold grace from others. And so what I want you to hear today is that in your struggle, in your trial, God is going to refine you. He's going to grow you. He's going to give you a purpose for the pain that you're going to endure. And as you endure, you can endure because of the grace and peace that you have from God. And then you give grace to others. And don't withhold grace from people who are suffering. Okay? So listen, this morning we're going to sing this song. And um, it's called Holy Spirit. And it's just this idea of, of welcoming God into this place. And so this morning, and you guys too, man, if you've been experiencing some kind of suffering or pain or affliction, and it's heavy on you, as we sing this song, I'm going to invite you guys to stand. And as we sing this song together, if God has been working in your heart or you're like, Pastor Adam, I've, I've just got some stuff that I need someone to help me bear. I've got a burden that I need help with. I need to know that somebody cares, that somebody can walk with me. I'm going to invite Pastor Jeff, and I'll be up here, and our elders, and any of the leaders in the church, and we're just going to kind of stand up here while we sing this last song. And I want you to come down and pray. God hears you in your prayer. And then invite someone into that with you, man. Someone who loves you, someone you know and trust. Invite that person to walk with you. Ask God to give you the courage to go to your friend or your brother or your sister in Christ and say, hey, listen, I need some help. And brother or sister in Christ, if somebody comes to you, respond in a way that God would respond to walk with us in that trial. Amen. So let's stand together and let's sing. And if you need prayer this morning, we'll be down here in the front and we'll be ready to pray with you.